welcome everyone to the now seems like at least in Toronto fall edition of the web series Canada discussion panels. Um, today we're going to be chatting all about acting and tips and tricks to level up and you know up your game basically. So our panel today includes three amazing actors Jordan Rodriguez, Shailene Garnett and Emmanuel Cabongo. Everyone say hi. Hello. <laughs> hey everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for doing this, guys. Um, so why don't we just jump right into it um, and talk about something that either people, I feel like it may be a love-hate relationship, but auditions. <laughs> um, so it's obviously a part of the acting game that is fun, but also can be stressful and nerve-wracking for a lot of people. So um, I would love for each of you to kind of chat a briefly about like an audition experience that taught you a lot about the process and maybe a tip that you have for actors with regards to act like audition and the process. I can go first. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's maybe not so much an audition that I had, but I had a small stint as a reader in an audition room. And that was game changing because I think as actors, we're taught, this is your five minutes, this is your space, do what you need to do, blah, blah, blah. But when you're on the other end, and you see like 12 people coming in for a role, you very quickly realize all you have to do is come in, say hello, take your mark, do your lines, say thank you, goodbye. And that is it. And the amount of people that have come in and asked for the camera to be adjusted, ask for the reader to stand on different sides of the camera, put on these theatrics coming into the room, like we don't need all of that. As actors, we don't need to do any of that. Just hello, my lines, thank you, and get out. So did that change how you auditioned oh, after that? A thousand percent, because it discredited a lot of stuff that I learned in the very beginning. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people are being taught a lot of fluff that you have to grow out of over time. And it's just helpful to know it's not about uh, making small talk in the room. It's not about where the camera is angled. It's not about where the reader standing. Just be prepared enough to come in, look at the reader, say your lines, be pleasant, and then leave. And then forget about it. Go about your day, and if you book the job, great. Would you guys agree with that, Jordan and Manny? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I try and cut out as much of the fat as possible. Like, in, if they want to have a chat at the beginning, absolutely. Let's have a chat. But, you know, for me personally, because I'm Australian, I try not to speak too much because if I'm just pretending to be myself in an American accent, it gets very confusing. And if they know I'm Australian, then they're going to be listening out for the Australian accent. Um, but yeah, I just try and keep it short and simple, like, hi, how you doing? And then straight in to the tape. Um, and then... After that, yeah, just, just cutting out the fluff. It, it's, it's, you know, there's hundreds of people a day. So I think it, it's really important to just know why you're there and it's do the audition and that's it. Totally. Um, I think personally for me, um, it, it's, it's not certain, like you know, I've learned something new from each audition, but I think from doing thousands and thousands of auditions it's really about sort of leaving it in the room forgetting about it so you can move on to the next um there's this sort of uh i don't know this idea of like when we audition and say we don't book that we kind of uh, some people can bring that into the next audition it's like a, a so, sort of like a backpack and you're, you're bringing that weight into the next one. My tip would just be to leave it in the room, forget about it. If they call you back, they call you back. If they don't, it's fine. Just don't bring that energy into the next audition. Especially if you have more than one audition in a day. I'm sure that's very important. I think what a lot exactly. of people- Exactly, you kind of just have to throw it in the back of your mind. I think what a lot of people lose sight Sorry. of, and I'm definitely guilty of this, is that just because you love the audition and you think you did a great job doesn't mean you're the right fit. And that was so evident when you see, you know, people coming in for take after take, 
some people are just so obviously right for a role and it ha might not have anything to do with their performance, just their look, their demeanor, their attitude. And that's what we don't usually get the, the privilege of seeing as actors. We just think, I've gone on all these auditions, I, I have or haven't heard back. But on the receiving end from, you know, the director, the producers, they know who they want. And if you're the right fit, you're going to get the job. Yeah. So you can't, like Jordan is saying, you can't carry that out with you because there's so much that's just beyond your control. Yeah. Emmanuel, do you have any audition stories that you think would be? Yeah. For me, it was a few years ago, my, the first time I had an audition in LA, I remember I tried to, uh, huh? I tried to come in with this attitude that I needed to be off book and um, it was for a big casting director who I had taped for before. And so this was my first time seeing her in person. And I, I was really excited, but nervous at the same time. So it was a pretty challenging role, but I had done my homework. You know, I, 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 I did everything I need to do. But when I got in, I was nervous. And it was also my first time auditioning in LA. And so as I was starting, I couldn't remember my lines. And at the time, my script was, I think I threw my script on the ground. I didn't want to hold it. And um, as I was doing my audition, I choked. I forgot my lines, um, perspiring. <laughs> And the casting director looks at me and is like, hey, you're allowed to hold your sides. You know, <laughs> you're allowed. In the back of my mind, I'm like, no, I don't want to hold my sides. I'm an actor. <laughs> you know, and I try again. Uh, and again, I can't remember my lines. And he's like, just, 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 just read from the, read, just read from this paper. And I'm like, oh. And I picked up those sides and I did my audition reading down. And it was the first time I wanted to be out of that room so quickly because I felt so embarrassed and defeated at the fact that I had to hold my sides. But then I quickly learned that the sides at an audition, whether it's on a tape or in the room or now on Zoom, isn't your enemy, it's there to guide you, it's there to protect you, and it's there to be your friend. And so since that experience, I never go in a room without my sides. And quite frankly, I've booked a lot more jobs holding my sides than when I wasn't holding my sides. So it doesn't say, you know, you don't go in unprepared, you don't go in not knowing your lines. But for those occasions when you are hit with the surprise where you know you're going in, you're going in for an audition, but they don't tell you that it's a, it's a producer session because that happens too. You show up in the room and you're like, oh, shoot, I didn't know that the director was going to be here or I didn't know that the producer was going to be here. And just in case, you know, if that does happen to you and you do forget your lines, you have your sides right there and if you have to look down then you look down and continue on. So that's a tip I would give to actors there. You don't have to prove that you have this great memory and you could remember lines for days, you know, as long as you know how to act and uh, you have your sides there and, and besides you, it also makes the casting directors count comfortable knowing that, hey, okay, I could bring this woman or this man in and, you know, they have their sides. So you know, they're, they're, yeah. they know what they're doing. Nice. Yeah, yeah. that's a good tip. Going off what Emmanuel said, it's like, I think when you change the mindset of, you know, the casting director wants you to get the job. They're not there to judge you. They're not there. They want you to book it. They want to be the person that said like, hey, we discovered this person. Like we, we, we found the guy, right? Like, I think that's it, it, going off what Emmanuel said about like, don't go in there trying to prove something. Yeah. You got to go in there to do the job. Like that's what you're there for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I just think yeah. we remember being taught in our early acting years, like we had the fear put into us of you, ha in, in Canada, I'll say this for Canada, I distinctly remember being taught that you had to be off book because if you go into specific casting directors the size in your hands, you would be blacklisted. And it's like exactly what Emmanuel is saying. It, you know, I can relate. I've booked more jobs with the sides of my hands, you know, because it's there for me to look at it. If you don't look at it, great. It's in your hand, it's off camera, it's not a big deal. But there's such a huge disconnect, I think, between what young actors or green actors are being taught in the beginning and then what they have, what they eventually come to over years of, of trial and error and, and figuring out what works for them. So to yeah. all of that, I think having the conversations with people who've been in the industry for, you know, 10 plus years, I think, between Emmanuel and Jordan as well, I think they've been in for quite a while, then you have that perspective and it just saves a lot of like wasted energy and self-doubt in the early years. Yeah. You know, it's... You'll have, you'll, you'll get some casting directors, like let's say you go out for a part, they like you the producers like you, you know, the director likes you and you get a call back. And sometimes in the call back, you'll get a note that please actors be off book, you know, cause it's a call back. You have enough time to kind of work on remembering the lines or whether it's the second call back or third call back or a screen test, you know, then if they have the executives or they have the network come in to have a look at you, then you know then it's probably necessary to be off book because they'll they'll let you know because they don't want the sides to then be a distraction not for you but a distraction to the network or the producers that is wanting to make a decision on whether to take you or not but initially in the beginning you know when it's like that initial uh from what i've experienced that initial audition you know it's nice to have those papers Okay. Yeah, I can definitely, from the other side of the table as a producer director, I, yeah, you can tell when someone is trying to be off book and it gets really nervous. And then the people who have sides but don't really look at them often slay their auditions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of like not a safety net, but like, you know, that if God forbid, you're like, oh shit, what's that next line? You actually have something you can refer to and that's okay. And yeah, I think it is about kind of that fake reality, basically, that's instilled in actors. Um, and I don't know what, if Jordan, you were in Australia, I'm not sure if you were taught the same thing there, kind of audition sort of etiquette, but- um, Yeah, so, yeah, we have a different way. Like we, we were raised to be off book um, back in Australia, but also we wouldn't just walk in a room and just start acting. like they would give us rehearsals. They like, they would give us as much time as we needed before we put on, on a tape. So when I moved over to America, that's when everybody was like, Oh, you have to, you go in there, you say, Hey, and then you just start acting. And so it's, you know, it, it really is doing the rehearsal in the waiting room in your head. Like it's the visualization. It's all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot quicker pace in America. Um, yeah. and it's a pace that you just have to get used to. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, all of each of you have had different experiences on different kinds of shows. Um, so can maybe each of you give like one example of a lesson, an important lesson that you've learned while on set of one or more of the shows or films you've been a part of and yeah, just explain, you don't have to necessarily name names or anything, but just kind of give some context, I guess, for what happened. Um, yeah, I have one. I mean, and this just was learned over time. Um, the, the first thing that comes to my head is like, you know, you work 12, 14 hours a day. You, you might be in every scene that day. You might be in the first scene and then the last scene of the day. Um, but, you know, it, in the morning when you're having your coffee or whatever, you look at what scene is going to be, is going to need the most energy that day, whether it's like an emotional scene, whether it's an, a very physical scene, you know, we have a battery at the, at the beginning of the day and you 
you, you kind of need to mentally prepare yourself and your body for that one scene that end of the day you have to have full control of how much energy you uh, exhaust throughout the day so that you can hit that shot at, um, that that really important moment the, the the if it's a key moment for the story for the character it's so important sometimes like i learned the hard way when you have that really big scene at the end of the day and you just didn't you just didn't use your energy wisely on set. You may have burnt yourself out in the first half of the day. And now it's gonna be a real struggle to get to that place. And those moments, those key moments for the characters in the story, it's really crucial that you understand and that you, you really prepare yourself mentally and physically to get to that point, the important moment. Yeah. That that that's sort of the big lesson for me. I've just I've I've screwed it up so many times. It's 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 not funny, but um, now I you know I, I, that lesson will stay with me for the rest of my career. Nice. Yeah. One thing to to uh, be aware of uh, on sets is uh, sometimes the direction of the wind can change. You know. Um, you could have uh, a, uh, a director who likes to rehearse, and rehearse the scene or rehearse the beats of what's gonna happen. And sometimes you don't have those directors who wanna do that. So I think being, being, being uh, ready for, I mean, you know, you do your homework, you prepare your lines and you emotionally prepare yourself, whatever, you know, however you're trained. But sometimes you have cases where the writer, if it's not the director or if it's not the producer, will want to change a line or change the way something is delivered. And you've been working on these lines a whole day, or maybe you have a long monologue and they want to rewrite it right there and then or shorten it and you've prepared it a certain way. So I think sometimes it's important to prepare yourself for changes or maybe they will take your line and give it to another actor or another character in the scene and uh you having to then you know you either excited to deliver this line or deliver this scene you have to be able to just like roll with the punches and the flow of the changes that happen sometimes on set when the creative team feels they need to make a change mm. Does that happen yeah, to you? I think that goes with auditions as well. Like your performance shouldn't be set in concrete. Like yeah. you, sh you should be able to, to, to change or uh, drop what you had planned and then go somewhere adapt. else. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be able to adapt. Yeah. You gotta be able to adapt. You know, you might say something and then maybe the writer is on set and they're like, ah, you know, I don't really like the way he's saying that line. Can you try this? And they right away change the line into something else. And, you know, you got to be able to just like, okay, adapt. So. Yeah. Thank you backing off of that. Um, something I think is extremely important that actors need to get used to is the idea of not cutting themselves, especially if we're on set. You know, it's one thing if like you go into an audition room and you have a bad start and saying, look, I'm going to start over. But I've seen it so many times when actors are coming in and they don't feel like they're delivering it the right way. So they cut, 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 cut the whole scene. And this is, you know, we'll have many people on set, lots of backgrounds reset, whatever the case is. And that's just one of the most frustrating things because from the outside, you're like, that was a perfect performance. Not that I'm the director, but... I what you're feeling and what we're showing, we're not, we're not in sync. And we have to realize that we were hired to do a job that they think we can do. And so already there should be an amount, a certain amount of confidence that comes with that because we, we are, okay, look, we're hired based on what they've seen, what we can do. So they have an idea and the director will come in knowing what they want and they'll finesse the take. So if you do, you know, like you have an idea, you, you've had a set in stone what you want to do, the director comes in and modifies it, have that flexibility, like both Emmanuel and Jordan are saying, but also have the confidence to just deliver what you have 
and let the director be like, okay, that was great or maybe not great. Let's adjust it. Look, I trust in you, do your job because we're flexible, we're active, we're flexible. Man, the amount of people have cut themselves is just so heartbreaking because then it weighs on their confidence as well. And you can see that just diminishing over from take to take to take. So I'm I, guilty. I think that, are I'm you? So guilty yeah, of that. man. But yeah, I mean, you're also, totally right. You have some, you have some di- to add to that. You have some directors who are open to being more co- collaborative. Absolutely. And so um, there's some, some, some productions that will allow you to play a bit more. So let's say, you know, you have a director who likes to shoot a lot of takes you know, whether it's close-ups or medium shots or, or, or a full shot, give yourself that opportunity to try things, you know, and as a director, if they feel like you're stirring off a beat a, a bit too off to the right or too off to the left, you know, they'll kind of stir you back. But as an actor, if you want to kind of stretch yourself a bit more, you know, to see how far you can bend your instrument, it's okay to ask a question or say, hey, can I take that? Can I do another take? And maybe can I try something? Yes. It, it doesn't hurt to ask. You know? At the end of the day, this is a collaboration, you know, and especially if in situations where this is, let's say an independent project, look at it as an independent project. The director or the writer or the producer, they have a lot more writing on this than we as the actors do. And so they're going to want the best possible take. So like Emmanuel saying, yeah, go for it. This is your opportunity to shine. And if it's too far out there, it's too far out there. Guess what? We're going to pull it back, you know? But I think some, another thing that I learned the hard way is the importance of setting the tone, especially if you're in a larger, if you have a larger role in the show or the production and you have that capability of meeting everybody and welcoming everybody, Cause I've been on set sometimes as like a recurring character and the main cast, like they all buddy buddied up and you don't feel included. So when you're on the flip side and you have that rapport with the main cast or you are the main cast, when the newcomers come in, they don't know anybody. They're there all day for a few days. And you want to make that experience pleasant because the audience shouldn't know who is new and who is not. It should be one big, as much as possible look, you know, things happen, people clash. But if you have that ability, just make it a really friendly environment. The work atmosphere just becomes so much more comfortable and you can just play so much, like so much more freer. Yeah. And I think a lot of that actually does come from, it comes from the actors, but it comes, that tone I think is set kind of from the director and producers. So if they kind of set a tone of collaboration and, and, you know, friendliness and all of that, I think that there's a trickle down effect um with both the crew and cast i mean obviously as you said the cast hopefully the main cast would do that too but i definitely even just from my own experience as a director and producer like my attitude affects everybody as well so it's it's kind of like it is a huge team effort to make stuff happen so hopefully everyone has a positive attitude that makes it a lot more pleasant for everyone um i just want to kind of shift gears a little bit um in terms of, you know, like every actor has their own process um, and every actor studies different things in terms of the craft. So can each of you just describe briefly who and or what you study on a regular basis and maybe some unique things that you study to improve, whether it's techniques or other things? Okay, Um, I really, really enjoy uh, Meisner technique. I study with um, an instructor named John Riven. He was a student of Meisner and his technique differs a little bit from the traditional way in that over the last, I think 14, 15 years, he's catered it more towards television and more towards the industry now, which is a lot more raw and let's say edgier. And what I like about that is you're literally just standing up there and repeating with a partner black shirt, black shirt, black shirt. And you're training yourself to be more in tune with your instincts and get out of your head. And that to me has been the more real life audition scenario in that if you 
hold yourself back from the exercise, you alone are going to feel like crap, you know, just like you would in a bad audition. But if you give it all you have and you tune out, you know, essentially tuning out the world and focusing on your partner and how you're feeling riding those waves, then you feel great, you know, hug it out afterwards, get on with it. And when it comes to high pressure situations in audition rooms or on set, you're already there and you're already trained to prepare or you're prepared for that. Is that something you uh, use when you're on set with your partner just before the scene? Like, no, you, no, you, no, no, it's you just, like, that's sort think of like, you do um, your own time. it's so think of like training for uh, a sprint, you know, you're going to do all these crazy exercises to get your body in top shape. Then you go onto the track and you do the 100 meter sprint and that's it. So you don't really do the exercises to, you don't do the exercises leading up to the sprint, the actual race. It's just getting your body trained for it. So in the action of that, going and studying Meisner and just practicing in the classes, you know, for three hours or every class, whatever it is, you're just naturally becoming more prepared. So when you read your lines and you're with the reader or you're, in, you're on set, you're just more connected or you're more prepared to kind of swing back whatever comes your way and not be afraid of the instincts, which has been my problem in the past. You're just like holding back so I'm not too mm. much. Yeah, sure. Mm. Yeah, I've been um, studying at Anthony Mandel for the past year. Um, all right, because <laughs> I don't know, it's not really a technique, it's just more so. We're, we're, your everybody's at a different stage in their uh, capability as an actor and uh, how far they can uh, reach out outside of themselves or within themselves you know and um, it's just been really great to just get up on the stage and try things take risks I think I see a lot of people in acting class and they're just trying to get it right. And they're trying to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing. I, I see class as a playground. I see it as the place where you make mistakes and where you fail so that you can learn from it. You know, you can, you can, there's a lot, you know, it's, it's life, right? We make mistakes and we learn from them. We, 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 we pick ourselves back up from those. But, you know, it's, it's better to fail in the, in the classroom than it is to be on the set or in the audition room, you know. But I also think um, something that's really helped me, I think, in my career, um, I, I, you know, I started filming TV when I was 15 and I always thought it was about, you know, the close up. It's about the subtleties and all that stuff. And so that's how I that's how I sort of trained myself. And then when I moved over here, I, um, I started working with a coach named Brad, Brad Flesher. And he, it, it was, we studied theater, we studied plays. And um, it, w what I learned from that is you, <laughs> you have to translate to the person right in the uh, front row, but also the back row, right? And you have to have the, the same vulnerability, the same emotional depth. Um, and, and, and what we kind of practice was making it as big as possible, making it as sort of large as possible. So just see how big you can make it. Because once you get it to its max, that's when you can bring it down to whatever level let, let's say the director wants it to be it, it, i think it's just easier to pull back to tone it down than it is to be on a set and try and like push it to where it needs to get energy wise um, that's a great note that's that's amazing yeah i mean it's just it, it's so much it's it's so much harder to get from like oh you know give it more energy and you start yeah. yelling or you start you know it's just easier to kind of like, once you know where your max and limit is, it's kind of easier to bring it down to whatever it needs to be. Yeah. Um, 
so I always, you know, when I practice lines, whenever I read with a uh, scene partner or whatever, I, I try and make it as big as possible so that, you know, your body is warm, you, you, your emotional depth is warm. It's, it's yeah, it, it's kind of helped me a lot. How about you, Emmanuel? Sorry, that was... <laughs> That's awesome. For me, um, I equate everything to sports. And uh, being an athlete, I've learned that you, you play how you practice. You know, there's some basketball, for example. There are some people who, I had this coach, he used to say, you know, don't be those model basketball players where when they're warming up, they're dunking, they're doing 360 windmills, you know, they're making those shots. But then come game time, they're not doing any of that. You know, they're not dunking the ball. They're not doing windmills because it's, it's different, right? So the way you practice is the way you're going to play. So for me, I've studied with different coaches, you know, here in Toronto, in Los Angeles. And I've learned that you... With, with things, with life, with acting, you don't, you, 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 you eat them, you, you eat the meat, you don't, you know, you spit out the bones, you know? So there are good things that you could take from some teachers. There are good habits that you could take from some teachers. And there are also not so good habits that you don't need to implement in your, in your career or the way you approach the art and, uh, I remember when I met Chris Hemsworth and I asked him for some advice. And the first thing he said to me and that I continue practicing to this day is do it your way, you know, do it your way, like what works for you. And that, cause at the end of the day, not everybody uh, wants to win an Oscar, you know, not everybody wants to, uh, you know, walk red carpets and, you know, go to all these major events. And so not everybody is going to be a Daniel Day-Lewis. Not everybody is going to be, have that dedication within themselves to be a Viola Davis, you know, because it's, it takes a certain amount of discipline and a certain amount of dedication, depending on what you want for yourself. You know, some people say, hey, I want to be an actor, but they don't understand that, okay, if in order to be an actor, you have to read every day. You have to work on your diction every day. You know, you have to understand, oh, it's, it's good. You don't have to, but it's good to understand or to be well balanced in different topics. You know, do you just dream of being an actor based on the films that you watch or the actors or, or filmmakers that you try to emulate or do you take time to study about bees you know do you take time to study about how pollution affects the world because let's say you do get a role where you have to play a scientist and there's this conversation within the dialogue where you have to talk about bees and you kind of go oh shoot you know I remember when I watched this documentary about bees that then you know I kind of understand what I'm talking about here when I'm reading the script all right, so for me, I try to learn about different parts of life because art mirrors life and life mirrors art. You know, there's been cases where I would get, uh, I've gotten an audition. I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know this word. I don't know what the sentence means. And there's been other cases where I'm like, oh shoot, I remember when I read about this or when I read about this in a, in a newspaper or when I watched a documentary about this specific topic because you don't just want to be like what Jordan said, you know, when he first started acting, it was all about this, you know, you don't just want to be a talking head, you know, you want to be able to, to use your whole instrument and portray these characters that are on paper, because at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's a saying 90% is the script and that extra 10% is those, when you look at a script, you know, for me, uh, the writer or the producer or whoever wrote the script 
has written it on that blank page in black. And so the rest of the white spots is my job to fill. I have to figure out how to fill up all that using my instrument. We were not all the best singers or the best dancers like yourself, Leah. You know? I think Jordan, Jordan's also a dancer, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, all have, we, all have, we all have qualities that are unique and special. And I think it's really important to utilize those in your practices and also when it's time to go. Yeah. And this kind of does segue into the next question I had. Um, and by the way, anyone who's writing in the Q&A, we'll, I'll leave some time near the end to we'll work through some of these questions. So um, we'll kind of try and power through the next couple, if that's cool with you guys, um, of my questions anyway. So this kind of conversation goes into the next thing about what you kind of do in your personal life that helps you or amplifies things in your career in, in, in acting. So, I mean, for example, going off of what uh, Emmanuel was saying about, you know, playing sports, like physical exercise. So can each of you kind of talk about maybe things you do on the daily basis in your personal lives to kind of stay in a certain Okay, I'll kick that headspace? off. I'll kick that off. Meditation. I'm not taking things personal. Uh, taking care of my body, mind, soul, spirit every single day, especially now with everything that's going on, you know, so staying sharp daily. I mean, you don't always have that energy every day, but you know, it's good to do something every day. You know, I, I feel like for me, it's important for me to be better than I was yesterday, you know, whether not just as an actor, but also as a human being, you know, how do I interact with family members? How do I interact with myself? That self-talk, you know, that, 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 that talk sometimes that makes you want to doubt certain things about yourself to yourself. You know, that's also in turn important on, uh, when it comes to growth, when it comes to working on yourself. Because, you know, you have some cases where you, you have those actors who are doing so well with their life, but then you don't really know what's going on in, going on in their personal life and you have people who overdose you have people who commit suicide you don't know you know and so for me doing things like that improving you know, my reading improving the way i allow my thoughts to be formulated to not be reactive and be more responsive and also to having fun i love to dance you know, I love to play sports, uh, eat right, cook. And uh, another thing, too, is the art of um, networking. It's another thing. Uh, not everybody has the ability to have that business acumen. Not to say you have to go to business school to understand how to network, but I, uh, I think, you know, the more you practice, you know, the easier it, be it becomes where it starts to lead into cases where you don't have to audition anymore. You know, you start to land roles just from having meetings, you know, just from having a good come. For example, you know, I just finished doing something last week and it was based off just the conversation I had with the guy just from networking, you know, and them uh, following me on social media, me following them on social media. And so here comes this project and they can't find, they can't seem to find the right person for this project. And that executive producer remembered, oh shoot, you know, there's this guy I know, you know, he might be right for the part. And he himself sends me a personal message. Hey, Emmanuel, uh, I got this thing. Would you be interested? I don't know if you're into this stuff. And, I'm, and I read the thing, I'm like, hell yeah, I want, I want to do that job. Hell yeah, I want to do that. What do you mean? <laughs> you know, but like, I, I, that comes from, going out, failing, you know, trial and errors, you know, you know how many parties I've tried to sneak in and kind of bomb and how many <laughs> parties I snuck in and I got into and I'm rubbing shoulders with like Wesley Snipes. I'm like, oh shoot, I didn't know I would get into this party. And then that leads to something else, yeah. you know? So um, practicing every day, like on developing yourself for me is important because you never know where it's going to take you. For sure. How about the, how about Shailene, Jordan, you want to jump in with what you guys do? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, Manuel said it perfectly. I mean, mind, body, soul, meditation, physical exercise every day, sunshine, you know, we're, we're, we're students of life. Like we're forever growing. There's no point that we're going to hit and we're like, oh, we've, we've, made, we've figured it out. It's like, there's so much to learn. There's so much to do. Um, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I, you know, especially during this quarantine time, I've like taught myself so much stuff because there's so much time. I like cooking and I, I've started surfing more and, you know, I've, I, I even got into composting. It's, it's, there's so much to do. There's so much to do and it doesn't have to always be so serious. Like it doesn't always have to be about acting people learning about people learning about their story asking them the right questions you know being curious you know being on set and just having a curious mind that's something you have to work on as well it's something you have to practice being curious and uh learning how to be able to ask the right questions uh there's, there's so much to it but it's it's just i think a mental note for everyone should just be continue learning you never there's just so much to know there's so much to learn and that will all and all the little details you know composting gardening like cooking these are things you can just throw into a character there's things that no one might ever see on set or might never see, like the audience might never see, but it's, it's happening. It's, you know, you've done the work, you know, it, it, so, but it's, it's those subtleties. It, it's, I don't know. You, it, as we grow as human beings and as actors, we try and make our characters as three dimensional as possible. And as long as you've got like a big story and history in your character, it's, it's, it's going to come out. It's going to come out somehow. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Shaylee? Yeah. I mean, kind of the same thing. Um, for me, it's important to focus on the other things outside of acting, just because I can, and I know a lot of people like myself get so obsessed with the world of acting and start comparing and, you know, how come this isn't working out? How come that's working for someone else? And you know, the illusion of social media, as I call it. So it's very important to me that I dedicate time every day, if possible, to focus on other interests that I have and developing other skills or learning new things like, you know, Jordan and Emmanuel were both touching on. Because look, you know what? I, I kind of break it down to a barista at Starbucks. You know, they're really great at making the frappuccinos and the designs, but at the end of the day, they're probably not coming home watching documentaries on coffee every single hour of the day they're not constantly practicing like they have other things to do they have other interests like composting and gardening and just doing things that make them feel great they're going to come back to their job refreshed and revived and ready to make the best design at a phone to give to the next customer and i think that makes them a better performer you know a better, better at their jobs so if you go and i can only say it for myself there have, been, there have been a lot of times when I've got so bogged down with, with obsessing over what I think people are doing, how they're better at their jobs than I am. Why can't I this? Why can't I that? So I just remove that from my equation, focus on other things, live my life, you know, and it just makes acting and auditions even, like even the worst part of the industries, it makes it fun. And I think that element of fun to your work just makes you a better performer. That's a great point. Fun is key. Um, one thing I've learned, I mean, I can, I'll just chime in here quickly, but you know, like everyone is saying, I think physical exercise, you know, mind, body, spirit is important. And I, you know, get coaching and it's okay to get coaching and help from people in areas that you need it. And I think 
there is this stigma of like asking for help when you're in one and all of everything in your life is connected, you know, and I really learned this the last few years is like, if one area of your life is down here, it actually affects all of the other areas. So you have to constantly be working on every part. If you focus only on one and it's great, oftentimes there's other areas that are not so great. So it's like, you need to, it can't always, always be about one thing. It has to, there has to be a balance. Um, so yeah, that's, I think very, all the points you made were very helpful and I'm definitely learning something. So thank you. Um, lastly, this is kind of a, I'm kind of want to end this before the Q and A on like a pretty important note. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, as we've said, uh, and in a lot of areas, some changes need to be made. Actually, a lot of changes need to be made, I should say. Um, so, and the situation for, you know, a lot of communities, and especially those in the BIPOC community, um, are having a hard time. And it's, and I kind of wanted to get your viewpoints on what changes do you think need to happen specifically in the entertainment industry? Or, and if you want to even specify that further with the acting, you can, but I just kind of wanted to see what, from your viewpoints, what you feel needs to happen and what action steps you think can be taken in order to reach that change. I think, I've thought about this so much. This is, I think there needs to be more blind casting. I think Grey's Anatomy was like the first or one of the, the bigger projects that had blind casting and it worked out brilliantly. But to that, this is kind of a, a a trigger point for me is that in the effort to cast blindly we're given scripts and in the scripts there's always one word or one line that highlights very clearly what the production is actually looking for which then means if I know I'm not the right fit but a casting director wants to cast blindly and bring me in to potentially be a wild card chances are given the state of the industry now it's like hyper aware, hypersensitive, I'm probably not going to book the job if it's a very clear descriptor of what the character needs to look like. So then I'm thinking it comes down to, is it an opportunity for me to show a casting what I'm capable of? Or is this something that I know I'm just wasting time and shouldn't go for? So I, I haven't figured out how to navigate that. But I guess blind casting is my answer. Well, I think that... Well, what yeah. is... Blind, blind casting? casting. Wait, what is that? So it's like mean? not hiring a token, yeah. not hiring um, Asian just because they're Asian, just because it says, oh, this is a book of really smart math student. Oh, they must be Asian. Or this is a gangster. Oh, right. he must be black. Just, mm. you know, or, you know, the name like a stereotypical name, oh, we have to have a certain ethnicity to match that name. Just have an open casting if it's not necessary, mm. if race is not, or ethnicity is not integral to the character or the storyline, then just open it up to bring more options to that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, how to bring, I, lo how to I love that. I mean, yeah. here, Oh, go ahead, go, go ahead, Jordan. You go. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. Um, no, I was just saying, like, oh, we're getting lag. Yeah, tokenism. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. But the, yeah, what we need to focus on is characters. I just because I'm Asian doesn't mean I'm a certain kind of ca character. That doesn't mean I'm. You know, I, I've noticed, especially the beginning of moving out to America, is that I was either going for the nerd, like the tech whiz, or I was going for an idiot or someone dumb. It, it was kind of no characters that I was like, oh, yeah, I really connect with this role in, in terms of personality. Um, and I think... It's, it's, a movie like Crazy Rich Asians really changed that stigma because you realize within the community of Asian people, there are different personalities and different characters that all add a different flavor and a different um, a color to the, the script and to the story. Because you focus on the characters, and, you're focusing on the storyline and not what they look like or how they sound. 
Yeah. Exactly. And it's just something that, you know, it, that we the the wheels are turning, but you know it's happening. And I mean, in Australia, it, they have a lot of catching up to do to America. But it, in terms of the American market, yeah, I, I really like that the, the idea of blind casting is because you can go in and prove yourself with um, it, saying that it can it can look yeah. like me. The surfer chill dude could look like me. The, you know, the musician, the the jock could look like me. You know, it, it's it's and it's it's also for the audience, yeah. for uh, an Asian kid to see me in that role. Um, it, it it means a lot. If I if I saw more people of color playing, uh, not the token. There'd be so much growth. I, I don't know. I, my my brain. It, it's 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 a hard question to answer, honestly. Yeah, but I think you I'm, also you I also want to add to something the, quickly yeah. before I forget. Um, I think then that comes down to then if you're doing blind casting, then it comes down to like for example the writer or the producers to actually have that mentality of an open mind to be willing to change what their idea is because if if they do have an idea and if the blind casting is just like they're doing it to give the opportunity, but they still have an idea in their head. I think it it's really comes down to the people on the other side of the table need to genuinely have an open mind to be like, if someone comes in and kills it in an, in a blind audition, like casting, like, okay, I guess we're changing the character. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's having yeah. that viewpoint. And I think the problem is a lot of times there it's in the mindset of the people yeah. behind the table not being able to shift. But sometimes, look, and to their defense, and sometimes, true. based on a storyline, it makes sense for the character to be something. Like, look, I'm biracial, and I've, I've gone out, I've booked roles that were very integral to having a biracial character for the storyline. Whether or not the person who booked the role, which happened to me, is biracial or not, the character's storyline is very integral to that. So I totally get it. And I'm not saying completely cut out all, you know, specific ethnic casting, but it just comes down to there's a lot of whitewashing and that's been a hit. That's been a huge problem, at least in Hollywood for a long time. But then also to the extreme opposite, I noticed that there's, um, I call them the check marks. It's like, oh, well, we have the one Asian, we have the one black, we have the female this, we have the LGBT character. And it, it's, it's, to me, it doesn't seem like it's cast with authenticity. It's just cast to appease to the public. So it's like this teeter-totter and there's such a fine line of a solution that I don't think any of us have figured out yet. Emmanuel, did you wanna chime in with something? Um, change. Yeah. Change. change starts within, you know, and to a lot of people, it seems like this is the first time something like this is coming to light, but this has been out for a very, very long time. The reason why to this new generation, it seems like we need this change now, which is important, is because we have more access to the internet. We have more access to social media. We have more access to people speaking up a bit more, but it's been going on for a long time. For me, what's important, when I decided to be an actor, one of my first agents was trying to typecast me. And I remember him saying, you know, some of the only things you're gonna be doing is, is this gonna be a calling card. You're gonna be, you're gonna be the bad boy. You know, you're gonna be the tough guy. That's, that's your card. And I remember telling him, um, okay, that's, that's cool and all, but um, I want to try other things. You know, I want to try the young doctor. I want to try a police officer. I want to try a, a guy that, you know, that's just in college or cook, you know, why can't I go for those parts? And so as he continued sending me out to these roles that were similar, 
what I learned for myself was every time I went out, let's say, you know, tomorrow I went out for gangster number one. And then next week I, I go to my audition, I do my part. And then the following week or two weeks from that audition for gangster number one, I go see the same casting director for a different film, but it calls for gangster number three. I realized that my job was to show this casting director different parts of myself. So every time I went into this audition, even though it was a similar role, I showed her a different part of myself. I walked in differently. I dressed differently. I sounded differently. Just so that in her mind, even though my agent was trying to type, my agent at the time was trying to typecast me, in her mind, she was seeing a different part of me. And so I wasn't letting these casting directors typecast me because I was coming in for the same roles. So that's why I say change starts from within. With everything that's going on now, some of us have the ability to go out there and speak out or, or have a, a sense of power to either fund a project, you know, or speak to people who do have that access to fund projects to make changes, and some of us don't. So the only thing that we can do if we don't have those powers is change how we view things, is change our perspective towards things. Now, I can be sensitive because it's a sensitive time with everything that's going on, but I can't allow what's going on in the world to affect how I view myself. I can't allow what's going on around the world to affect how I view what I want. And so I could utilize this anger, frustration, the fact that some of these characters are written a certain way or it doesn't appease to a certain race or it, appeared, you know, it weighs more on the other side. I can only focus on what I can control, right? So for me, I started writing and I realized I'm like, oh my God, I actually like to write. And so through this writing, I've developed relationships with writers. I've developed relationship with showrunners. And now I have started pitching shows. And so now I'm not just viewed as an actor. I'm viewed now as a creator. Mind you, I didn't go to writing school. I was like, ah, I hate writing. I've left, I don't know what writing is. You know, I was so afraid to, to write, but then I realized, you know what, if I want to see a change, I have to be that change. So how, do, how am I going to see this change if I don't see this change within myself? Because we all have these capabilities. We all have these, these, these abilities to make a shift. We don't, we don't all always see it because we have this tunnel vision that things are supposed to be a certain way when it doesn't have to be a certain way. You know, the power is within us. And so once we are able to get in positions where we don't settle, once we are able to see that, you know what, I'm not going to let you determine or de, uh, um, try to kind of use me as a, uh, a puppet because you want me to do things based on what you believe. I've turned certain, for example, I've turned certain auditions down, be, down because I don't feel like I'm there or I don't feel like this is where I see my career going. And a lot of the, the times I get nervous about it, but then I'm like, no, I got to stick to my guns and believe in what I want. And that has led to me gaining more confidence within myself. With that confidence, people start to view you a certain way and you start to elevate your respect because you're talking about leveling up, right? Yeah. So you don't just level up by taking everything that comes your way. You're allowed to say no. You're allowed to say no to get the yes that you want. And the fact that I'm learning now on how to say no for the yes that I want, it's allowing me to gain this confidence. And this confidence doesn't just exude based on how you talk. It also exudes, you know, when let's say you go to a Starbucks and somebody just looks at you and like, man, you got this energy that, you know, is so palpable. You know, who are you? Oh yeah, hey, then you you know what I mean. But all that stuff is, it's the work you do inside, and that's how I think we're going to start to see this change. Because once you get to a certain level, you send the elevator back down, and then you start to pull people up. 
I love that. So, yeah. I like that. Well Send said. the elevator well down, said. pull people up. I love that. Well, I think this is a great place to kind of just answer some questions that have, are in the chat um, because I want to make sure we get to at least one or two of them. Um, so Jason asked, uh, should we, for multiple takes uh, on that subject, should we be doing our best to perform at the same way each take for continuity? or wait to get redirection or try something different on a subsequent take? What's your kind of- Oh, I think I think I said, I talked about that, right? That's for Jason? Yeah. Hey, Jason, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate your time, brother. Uh, or if you're a woman, some people are named Jason. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, once you do a take, it's gone. You know, forget about it. Don't try to recreate or reproduce what you, created you know let's say you have a really awesome take and the tears are flowing you know don't get caught up in thinking like oh my god i gotta copy what i just did that moment is done so i think living moment to moment is important and the more you learn on how to live moment to moment you're always going to be full regardless you know whether it's a take up close or a medium shot as long as you live moment to moment that take just like life is always going to be fresh and fresh and fresh and fresh. Well said, did Shailene or Jordan, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, I, I agree. I think if your intentions, if you know very clearly what you're, what you're doing, then there's a chance that your actions might be repetitive from take to take, but you can tell when it's manufactured versus authentic. So, you know, like Emmanuel was saying, if you're, if you're there in the moment and, you know, if my cue is, okay, I'm thirsty, I'm drinking a cup, or sometimes it's technical and having to merge the two. Mm -hmm. But usually I go off of the direction of the director. If I do a good take, chances are he'll say good job or he or she will redirect me and then say go again. With that new direction, you got to have to, you just have to marry, marry all of the ideas live moment to moment, but now I'm supposed to pick up a teddy. Okay, cool. Not take a drink. Okay, cool. So have that technical aspect of it while being moment to moment and seeing what can come up and chance that you'll create something even better than you previously thought you could or than the director wanted. Mm. Jordan, did yeah, you want to? I agree, I agree with both of you guys. I mean, I can't say it better than myself. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really about the, all, all the different parts of your brain merging into the one moment and being present. That's about it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I think to sum up, you don't have the intention, you're not focusing on recreating a moment. I think just, yeah. just the, the one answer is just be as authentic as you can be. Yeah. And just to, just to add to that, I know that we're, we're all the three of us are talking about being in the moment, you know, and practicing the moment daily, you know, that's why, you know, Shailene, I know meditates, uh, uh, Jordan was talking about meditation, you know, the art of meditation does teach you, you know, on to focus, you know, to focus on the moment, you know, some meditation, you can be meditative, not just by sitting down and listening to that meditation music and humming, you know, your, your life could be meditative, you could be washing the dishes and have a meditative life, you could read a book or walk and be in the moment, sunsets, walking, you know, sunsets exactly. You know, all that stuff that you practice in life that allows you to be in the moment is something that you can then take when you are on a set. Yeah, I agree. And one thing I've learned actually from my coaches, um, instead of being the effect of the physical universe, you actually put it there because oftentimes, and that helps being in the moment with the topic of being in the moment is when you like, and he gives the example of like, as an entrepreneur, you come and say hello to your computer. You know, it's like you, you, actually put it there rather than be the effect of it. And I find that technique really helps you be present. Um, so I'm not sure if that, how that would apply necessarily technically in an acting scenario, but. If, all, el if all else fails, just take dancing lessons. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, that, that can definitely translate on set because there are times when you get so caught up with like, oh my God, lines and whatever else is going on. Look at the person in front of you. Take a big breath and connect. Eye contact just goes so far. If you don't have an actor in front of you, okay, what is around me? I have a cup. I have a table. I have a this. And the more you start focusing on what is in your scene, 
what you need to be doing in that scene and why that turns everything out and that kind of just makes you a bit more focused kind of like the hello computer i think yeah cool but also yeah. yes erin also asked uh when it comes to self tapes how many takes would you all suggest i send in one per scene unless unless i can do something completely different or unless um asked to do multiple takes so do yeah. you send yeah. in the first one you do no, 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 no. I mean, look, I, I, <laughs> myself, and I know from people we've worked with, it's a bad habit of actors to want to find perfection. And mm. I had to master, try to master the art of, okay, let me do my work. Let me know the intentions. Let me know this, this, that, and the other. Do, I try to cut it off at maybe four max. Because if I do four takes with all my work in, like, look, there should be enough moments in my one scene, in my one take that I'm going to submit that they can see what I'm capable of doing. And you have usually two or three other scenes to do anyways. So between that five minute video you're submitting, you should have enough going on that they can say, okay, cool. I don't expect her to be a one take wonder because we're going to do multiple angles. We're going to do multiple takes anyways. So you can have, we can always, adjust but am i showing them that i have a, a good grasp of the character and that i'm right for the role and i know what i'm doing yeah so don't fall into about, the track you can go for hours doing self-tape trying to find perfection yeah it's, I, I think it's about getting the dot on the board it's not about hitting the bullseye it's about getting on the board show and that you're capable of. What I found with when you try and make the scene perfect, each line perfect, it kind of, for me personally, it becomes robotic. It becomes like I'm hitting a mark and it just seems unnatural. It's usually the first times, three takes for me. Emmanuel and Jordan, how many times would be like, okay, let me do a new take, one more take, one more take. And it's the exact yeah. same thing. Nothing yeah. changed. Yeah. So I mean, I, it's a, yeah. Yeah. You have moments where, you know, we don't always, we can't always control the environment, you know, so there's been moments where I've taped with friends or taped or helped friends tape, you know, you're doing a great take and the dog next door barks, you know, you can't really send that. You want to clear, you know, you want to good, you know, you, you got those juices flowing or, you know, or, or a plane goes by, you can't control that. You know what I'm pretty I mean? sure it's in a tape where I was in the Bronx one time and there is, I'm pretty sure it was a gunshot in the background at the end of my take, but I'm like, you know what? Yeah, sometimes you can use it. Yeah, sometimes you can use it, you know? <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have those casting directors who would say, you know, like, as long as there's clear sound and, 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 and a clear picture, you know, we want to be able to hear you and stuff like that. Uh, but like, you know, sometimes you, you do have, like Shailene said, you do have those casting directors who will say one take. And um, I try to send, it depends, you know, sometimes I'm picky and I'll probably send two, you know, uh, depending on how physical the character is, you know, so let's say if it's something really physical where there's a lot of movements, a lot of pieces, whether you have to go down on the ground or whatever it is, uh, I like to do one where it's a full body where you, you get to see like the physical aspect of what's going on and then one much closer so that, you know, they could also see that, you know, what's going on physically and what's going on, you know, up here and stuff. So I think, I think as a general rule, if you're the actor doing the audition, always be mindful of like the reader, you know? And so I think a general rule of, unless you're paying for a coach, but a general rule of thumb is probably what five or less takes because you should i should hope unless look first of all i have my partners i've worked with manual a ton and we had a process where we would show up and like look dude i don't know my lines and we would work together we had that time and space for each other to learn the audition and get the best take possible i've had friends where i have to show up and i'm like i feel very bad for asking you to help me and i'm aware of your time and i don't want to use up too much time so it's a weird thing doing self tapes, but if you can do the work and come prepared as much as possible, you know, have your partner kind of give you suggestions and just get it out of the way, 
because it's more damaging to yourself as the actor to just do constant, constant, constant takes and you just think about it all the time. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think there's just one last question. Um, did you, Aaron says, did you train, this is for Emmanuel, did you train with Earl from EVN Film Studios? He's saying, she's saying that his philosophy is similar to what you were speaking about. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay, well, that answers that question. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, um, oh, and then, hold on, there's some Q&A questions. Let me just read uh, a couple. Um, oh, uh, do you think actors that are just naturals bug you, or is that, like, not as common as one might think? What do you mean by natural? Like, just like, kind oh, of literally, natural. Huh? yeah. Pardon me, yeah. you that? What? Repeat like that. someone someone who's like, oh, I'm just a natural. I, I didn't study anywhere. I just kind of fell into acting and I'm just really good at it and I don't coach. Wow, you're blessed. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I think there's come to a certain point. In the beginning, you hear that a lot, like, oh, you're a natural, you'd be great at this. But I think as time goes on, you start to realize there's a lot you don't know, and this is a very technical industry. And mm -hmm. you find a coach or you find some sort of way of study to help you enhance that. So I, I, I don't know uh, about you guys, but I, I wish I were you. I wish I were you, natural. You know how much money <laughs> I would have saved from classes. But how many people have you met, though? That's my understanding. Uh, like, how many people have you met who've never studied anything, ever? Like, I think everyone just eventually, you know, studies something. Therefore, you're not just uneducated or unlearned. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, that's a good point. I think at the end of the day, whether someone's a natural or not, um, there's always room for improvement, so. But you can learn from them, like Emmanuel's saying, like, yeah. you know, okay, well, what are you doing that I can't do? You know, how can I learn from you as a natural? So I, I don't think there's room or need to hate on anyone, regardless of how they came up. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. Well, are there any other questions or just any other comments that you guys wanna say to uh, yeah just to you know people people out there you know have fun be safe uh, don't let anybody determine where you're going to end up you know the sky's the limit if you put your mind to it anything is possible anything can happen i mean you know i i grew up i didn't like english my my strength was math i hated reading you know and because i stuck to it and believed in myself you know i've recorded three audiobooks now you know mind you i i hated reading i hated reading i'm actually working on an audiobook now and so i i think you just have to really just you know believe in yourself believe in yourself believe in your ability and don't stop don't stop learning don't start improving yourself and just ask questions ask stupid questions. There's no stupid questions. Ask questions that, you know, uh, that you feel like will embarrass you, but who cares? You know, you only have this one life to live. So live it the best way you can and just go after, you know, aim for the moon, go after what you really, really want, because at the end of the day, it's your life. Nobody else. That's mine. Yeah. Well said. Shailene Jordan, I want both of you to say something. Um, you know, generally, general rule of thumb is always say yes, but know when to say no. And don't compromise who you are for the idea of a, you know, a job that might come. Because I think you're going to book the role that's meant for you. And you don't have to compromise your morals for anything. And it's so hard to speak after these two because they're so uh, eloquent with it. what they uh, say. No, you really, it. I've learned so much and I'm very grateful that I got to be a part of this. I didn't feel like I was on the panel. I felt more like an audience member and it was, it was very, um, it, it's the reminders, you know, it's, it, it is talking to your fellow actors, your fellow thespians. And um, it's, it's constant, constant growth. Never stop learning. Um, empathy. We all need to empathize more with each other. It will make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And thank, uh, thank you, Leah, for uh, hosting today. This is very, very awesome. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Leah. Very awesome. Of course. Well, thank you all for, for doing this. I, I definitely learned some things. And for me, it, it was great because as a writer, director, producer, hearing your viewpoints, I always have valued 
performers. I love performers. Um, I just, I'm in awe of you guys, like really. So um, it's just really nice to hear your viewpoints because I think it's really important that we all listen to each other's viewpoints and the more viewpoints we all are willing to experience, the better the world will be for it, I think. So with that, I think we'll end it off. Uh, thank you all for joining, you know, the attendees and all of you panelists, Emmanuel, Shailene, and Jordan. And until next time. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.